It's July the 20th, 1956, St. Thomas Bay, Malta. Two friends are going for a swim. On the left is Jack Smedley, a British Navy instructor. On the right is Tony Grech, a young Maltese student. There are no other human swimmers in the water. No trace of Jack Smedley was ever found. It's now known that he was attacked by a great white shark. In the 1960s, not long after the Jack Smedley incident, the Mediterranean turned into a tourist paradise. Holidaymakers have been encouraged by the tourist industry to see the Med as a benign swimming pool. No tides, no storms, and definitely no teeth. When we think of great white sharks, we think of places well away from us. California, Australia, and South Africa, where they can grow up to seven meters long and weigh over two tons. Once thought to be dumb, lonely plodders, they're now thought to be complex social fish. The top predators. Surprisingly little is known about how long they live, how they breed, and how far and wide they range. But you would have thought the Mediterranean was about as far away from Jaws as you can get. Nevertheless, in 1987, this huge white shark was caught and landed at a fishing port in Malta. At 23 feet 5 inches long, it's as big as a single-decker London bus. A young British shark biologist was so astounded that such a huge white shark could be found in the Mediterranean that he just had to find out more. Ian Ferguson has become a white shark detective. But the teeth are just so different. I mean, look at the... The depth of that. He believes white sharks are far more common in the Mediterranean than other scientists have realized, and he's determined to put them on the map. Helping him is American white shark researcher Mark Marks. And that's actually, we can note that it's a, a diagonal measurement. We're leaving Valletta, the main port of Malta, at nightfall on the trail of the great white shark. We're headed 50 miles south, halfway to the African coast. By morning, we will be in position. It's dawn, time to start work. This is chum, a cold seawater soup of minced mackerel. The oily chum slick spreads out into the distance to entice the sharks. Fish soup for starters, and now for the main course. If the sharks cross our path, the chum will lure them towards the boat, and the tuna heads are meant to keep them there long enough for Mark or Ian to photograph them, tag them, and take biopsy samples of flesh from them for analysis. Okay. 
nightfall on our first day, and no luck so far. It's a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. But then we are breaking new ground. This is the first time any scientist has ever tried to attract white sharks in the Mediterranean. At the crack of dawn, we head for the local fish market. It's almost impossible to get information on any sharks in the Mediterranean, let alone great whites. Getting facts means getting up early and working fast, before valuable data goes under the knife. Ian and Mark are in a race against time with the local fishmongers. The uh, sharp-nosed seven-gill shark, um, fairly common in the waters around here, between here and Tunisia, in deeper water. These again are deep water sharks. And with these uh, Centrophorus, the gulper sharks, we've got male, female, and another female. At the back of a fish wholesaler's cold store, we find something really exciting. A six-foot thresher shark. These animals have never been filmed alive at sea. Another hour and this valuable evidence would have been fish fillets. In all, there are 45 species of shark in the Mediterranean. Today's fishermen simply see the sharks they catch as meat. But in ancient times, Mediterranean man learned to hold sharks in awe. This Neolithic temple on the southeast coast of Malta dates back to 2,000 years BC. The white shark was known and feared by these early Mediterranean civilizations, especially by the ancient Greeks. They called it Lamia, the great flesh-eating monster. And it's a word which crops up time and time again in ancient Greek mythology. Herodotus, in 492 BC, gives the first known written account of sharks attacking human beings. He tells of how the Persian fleet was wrecked at the headlands of Athos in northeastern Greece, and as sailors floundered in the water, they were taken and devoured by sharks. During this period, we can also find a Greek tragic poem that tells of a sponge diver whilst clambering back aboard his boat, having his legs severed by a large shark. The poet who wrote it notes laconically that this victim was buried both on land and at sea. Well, of course, we all know the story of Jonah and the whale, but there's a twist to this seemingly benign tale. And if we look at the original Hebrew translation, it makes no mention of a whale whatsoever. It merely talks of a large marine creature. In the 16th century, the French naturalist Guillaume Rondelet, who himself claims to have found in the stomach of a white shark the body of a fully clad human being, suggested that it was no whale that took Jonah, but the Lamia, the great white shark. At the turn of the century, the French magazine Le Petit Parisien ran a series of articles about verified shark attacks in the Mediterranean. They recorded this attack on a Tunisian sponge diver in 1909. He lost his leg. These four young women were attacked off Trieste in the northern Adriatic. One woman died from her injuries. In 1909, there was a huge earthquake at Messina, Sicily. 150,000 people were killed. Many of them washed into the sea by a massive tidal wave. Two weeks later, according to this Italian scientific monograph, a large white shark was caught by fishermen further down the Sicilian coast near Augusta. When its stomach was cut open, they found the bodies of a child and a young man and woman. This is the woman's leg, from the knee joint down. And here are some more bones and the man's boot. 
This extremely learned Italian scientific paper about Mediterranean white sharks has been totally ignored by the international white shark fraternity. Scientists writing in Italian, French and Arabic have known all along that there were white sharks here. But their papers are virtually unknown to a scientific community that is English-speaking and mainly based in California, Australia or South Africa. Which is why today's visitors to the Med are entirely oblivious to the presence of white sharks. Yet since 1909, 40 people have been directly attacked by white sharks. That's one every two years. 18 of those attacks have proved fatal. Thanks to Ian Ferguson's research, we can now examine several recent shark attacks in some detail. On July the 30th, 1991, at Santa Margherita Liguri in northern Italy, Ivana Iacaccia spent a day at the seaside. Un giro in barca, in, un giro in canoa, è una bella giornata. Ho sentito un colpo terribile, mi sono trovata in acqua. dall'acqua sono riemersa ho visto una cosa che andava verso riva dal colpo ho pensato che fosse una bomba qualcosa allora sono scappata verso il largo dopo due secondi ho visto una cosa che rassomigliava a un pesce che nuotava con me alla mia stessa altezza Una cosa enorme. The fish followed her for what seemed an eternity, but never touched her. Mi, mi sono avvicinato alla riva e ho visto la, la signora in mare che chiedeva aiuto. Allora mi sono tolto lì la, la, la maglietta per andarla ad, a, a salvarla, ad aiutarla, anche perché no, non sapevo lì c'è di preciso di cosa fosse successo e ho visto la pinna e lo squalo diciamo che stava ruotando intorno alla canoa a quel punto lì mi sono spaventato e, e, e non credevo a, a, a quello che stavo vedendo perché mi sembrava una cosa stranissima cioè. ma era vero allora grosso modo così Cioè è tutto abbastanza grande, adesso io non... Così e mi seguiva all'altezza, cioè da 20 centimetri. E scappavo, urlavo e poi mi hanno salvato una barca che passava di lì. Sono... Mi ha raccontato che sono volata su una barca. Bathers were warned and the locals went on a shark hunt. The story made the London Times. This is the actual canoe that was attacked. It has since been treated with filler, but the tooth marks are clearly visible. But are they from a white shark? Having measured the interspace, in other words, the distance between various teeth punctures, individual punctures on the canoe, both here and elsewhere, it's clear that the individual teeth of the shark responsible for this attack were fairly distant. This actually tends to exclude a variety of shark species found here in the Ligurian Sea. And looking at these marks and having seen photographs of similar marks inflicted to surfboards and uh, fiberglass rescue boards in California, I would say with some uh, confidence that the animal responsible for this attack, bearing in mind Ivana's description of it, was Cacaridon cacarius, the white shark. This tendency for white sharks to attack floating objects explains an accident that occurred at Tarifa, Spain in 1986. Jose Luis Perez Diaz became the first windsurfer in the world to be injured by a white shark. 
White sharks are naturally inquisitive. The shark hit the back of his surfboard and as he struggled to regain control, it came back for a second bite and removed his foot. About a hundred miles north of Rome on the coast of Tuscany lies the picturesque Gulf of Baratti. In February 1989, it was the scene of a terrible accident. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, three men set off from Piombino near to here, and they travelled out in their boat and anchored about 200 metres beyond this secca or reef. One of the people on board, Luciano Costanzo, was a professional scuba diver, and his task on that day was to remove biological fouling from an underwater power cable that runs from the shore here. At some point on the seabed, uh, whilst chipping away at this uh, material, something occurred which we will never know. But what we do know is that according to the statements of the other two people on the boat, a good friend of Costanzo and Costanzo's son, the uh, diver rushed to the surface and appeared waving his arms vigorously in a state of panic and tried to swim back to the boat. As he was swimming to the boat, the witnesses state that a large white shark, about six metres in length, appeared next to him, circled around, and then before Costanzo could reach the boat, it charged at him, attacking his left side, bit down on him with some sort of shaking, and then took him underwater. Search and rescue boats were soon on the scene. This is the official videotape of their investigation. It has never been seen in public before. La ricerca fatta subito dopo l'incidente diede il ritrovamento solo di un piccolo uh, pezzo di tessuto eh, individuato perché i gabbiani eh, mangiavano qualcosa sull'acqua. They deployed an underwater video camera and eventually located Costanzo's flippers. Less than two meters away from the flippers, they came upon his air tanks and weighted dive belt. There was no other trace of him. La cintura delle bombole era chiusa, la cintura dei piombi era chiusa. E, e quindi come se la persona fosse stata sfilata, sfilata proprio, azzannata e sfilata dalle bombole e dai piombi. It was claimed that a white shark's tooth had caused this jagged rent in the webbing of the dive belt. And that the indentations on the air tanks had been caused by the shark's teeth as it grabbed and shook Luciano Costanzo. Italy went shark crazy. Eventually, extra divers were drafted in to try and find some trace of Costanzo's missing wetsuit, or body. When these sommozzatori vennero con la gabbia e fecero questo incontro che ci descrissero, quindi di aver incontrato un, un, un pesce di grosse dimensioni che si aggirava a circa un chilometro da dove noi stavamo lavorando, vennero loro a dirci di non andare in acqua. Erano pallidi, sopra c'era anche il figlio del Costanzo, il quale ci disse già c'è stato un morto, non mi importa se si ritrova eh, mio padre, ma non voglio che qualche d'un altro faccia la stessa fine. Io parlo per esperienza personale, da quello che ho visto io ritengo che l'attacco sia stato di uno squalo bianco. The official inquiry in Milan concluded that Luciano Costanzo had indeed been killed by a great white shark. White sharks are definitely here, so why don't we know more about them? The 
global community of shark scientists now acknowledges that white sharks are in the Mediterranean. But they've claimed that they are merely occasional visitors and ignored the possibility that they live here. This opinion is based in part on what little is known of the white shark's feeding habits elsewhere. This is Dyer Island in South Africa. Seal colonies like this are attractive to white sharks for feeding. And since white sharks congregate here, so do their scientific observers. What they see happening here has been generalized into a classic observer-biased assumption that seals and sea lions are the white shark's staple diet everywhere. Ergo, no seals, no white sharks. The white shark, at two metric tons in weight, is seen as a clumsy predator that relies upon ambushing seals close to the rocks, but lacks the agility to chase faster moving prey in the open sea. This little cove in the central Mediterranean was once home to monk seals. But since none have been seen here for over a decade, it's been argued that the white shark must also be a thing of the past. Now there's no evidence to suggest that monk seals have ever been preyed upon by white sharks in this region. And yet, despite that, if we look at uh, a popular book, a recent book which is regarded by many as a definitive guide to the white shark, it says, and I quote, white sharks have been found in the Mediterranean, but over centuries the depletion of its marine mammals has eliminated the white shark's major food supply and they are exceedingly rare. But Ferguson's data shows that white sharks are numerous. There are over 200 captures and sightings of white sharks since his record begins in the 1850s. Up to the 1950s, most of them come from the northern Mediterranean, particularly Italy and the former Yugoslavian coast of the Adriatic. But towards the present day, the bias shifts in favour of the central Mediterranean, southern Italy, Sicily, Malta and the North African coast. A particularly rich area of white shark sightings surrounds the island of Favignana, west of Sicily. We're off to Favignana, white shark country. Ferguson believes that the Mediterranean can support white sharks in the absence of seals, but to convince skeptics, he has to identify what their staple diet is, and he has to establish if and where they breed. Although Favignana is clearly a white shark hotspot, Ferguson and Marx are the first researchers ever to visit these fishermen to find out what they know about white shark behavior in the Mediterranean. It's the day of the Matanza, the ritual bloody slaughter of the tuna, from which the Mafia blood killings take their name. In the centre of the bay lies the Tonara, great lines of submerged nets which intercept the tuna as they migrate across the bay and funnel them inexorably into this narrow corridor of nets that has no way out. It ends in the death chamber, the Camera del Morte, which has four sides and a floor. Three walls of nets have already been formed by the boats in the background. And it is at this point, when they check the nets outside the death chamber, that they have often found white sharks trapped. They too have been after the tuna. He said that another one was in 78. Oh, really? He means, he would say that he went all the time to control the nets. He was every, every, he remembered for sure 78 because every day he was on the rice boat checking okay. the nets. 
at around 30 meters deep yes. down there yeah. were this, this shark. Near the bottom, on the bottom? On the bottom, quasi al fondo. Si, eh. 32 meters, 31, the fondo era quasi a 30 meters, 29, 30 meters. There is deeper kind of 31 meters, so it was a 30 meters. It was almost on the bottom. Okay, he came to the bottom, I remember how it was now, and he said, it's him. It was a cask rock. A cask rock, a cask rock. Yes, that's good enough. In 1980, they found another white shark in the nets, towed it back to the quay at Favignana, landed it, and when they cut open its stomach, they found it had also eaten a juvenile dolphin. In 1987, another huge white shark, a female nearly five and a half meters long and weighing two metric tons. Inside that shark was an even larger dolphin. Okay, so they're all, they're all mature animals so all far. Mature. So, sono tutti animali maturi, diciamo, sì, sono sì. tutti grandi. Infatti questo qua aveva un delfino di 200 kg dentro lo stomaco. And the, the last one in 88, uh, he, he had kept in a stomach uh, an entire dolphin of over 200 kilos. Mm. There's, there's era, a... era trangiato in due pezzi, due bocconi. It was two pieces of this dolphin, mm -hmm. cut, in cut in a half. half. Uh, there was two of them. One was a female, the one they got, and the second one was a male. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, the female was trapped uh, uh, at the very beginning of the, uh, the dead cage. I mean, at yes. the very beginning of the corridor that yes. leads to the yes. cage. And it was there, it was dead, and they uh, take it out immediately. Um, the, the scuba diver went inside it and discovered that there was a second one, a male, and he was cutting the net. Uh -huh. to, oh, yeah. to take it out, mm -hmm. and as soon as it discovered it was still alive, and the shark moved and right. tried to beat him, but it escaped. Okay. Am I right in thinking that the other one was a male, the one which escaped? Yes, that for sure. The most dangerous job in the Tanara is that of the diver who checks the nets. So strong is the association between male and female white sharks at Favignana that they have a local saying, if you see a female, look around you, the male won't be far away. Has Clemente, when he's been catching tuna, ever seen tuna with shark bites I on mean, them, healed, you know, eh, tuna still alive? When you take the tonni, still alive and everything, someone has died? Yes, yes. How, yes. How, how, yes. how yes. often? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, one or two every year. One or two every year. Sì, dice ogni volta che fa una mattanza più o meno ne vedi uno. Sì, quest'anno ne abbiamo, ce n'era uno grosso che aveva un mostro. This year there was one, they only did one mattanza and there was a big tuna with these cards. Do they tend to be in the same part of the tuna? Sono dalla stessa parte del tonno, sono sul fianco, sono sulla coda. La maggior parte sono qua sopra la coda e... Here over the tail. E qualcuno qua vicino. Coming up from behind. That's interesting. Some to the back. Back of the head? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Where they have the fin, where they start yes. the fin of the yes. tuna. Between 1953 and 1988, these Favignana fishermen recorded a total of 16 white sharks. All of them had followed the tuna into the nets. Bites on the tuna suggest they are chased and eaten by white sharks. And the fact that male and female sharks are seen in pairs suggests they meet over the tuna. To white sharks, the tuna are the equivalent of a singles bar with a good restaurant. Our research overturns the simplistic notion that white sharks are clumsy muggers. To catch a tuna, the white shark must be fast and agile. They make full use of their dark dorsal surface to camouflage them against the deep while their sharp eyesight catches the tuna silhouetted against the light. Matanza proper is about to start. 
The fishermen are pulling up the net that leads from the outer chambers, closing the door on the Camera del Monte. The first sight. Matanza is a bloody business. They've been fishing for tuna like this since the Middle Ages. But the harvest is dwindling. Barely 40 tuna have been caught today. In its heyday, this tonaro would have landed over 300 fish at one Matanza. This year could very well be their last. Lean times ahead for the two main species that predate upon the tuna at Favignana. Homo sapiens and Carcaridon carcarias. These are dolphin. It's hard to accept that such agile, intelligent and social mammals could also be a staple food for white sharks but 80% of all white sharks examined in the Mediterranean have contained dolphins in their stomachs. The relationship between white sharks and dolphin is as ancient as this sea itself. This is the fossilized skeleton of a three million years old dolphin. Scars and cuts on its rib cage are dramatic evidence that it was once attacked and bitten by a great white shark. We have here three types of tooth impact dynamics. No? In such a manner, no, the, the shark detached a fragment of bones from the ribs. Another type no, is a rounded, a, a rounded uh, movement, a complex movement of the tooth. Another sample type is this, no, with a cutting impact no, action, no, with a cutting action eh? on the base of uh, uh, bias, no, marks distribution on the bones, no, it's possible to think that the dolphin was attacked by uh, uh, directly, no, uh, by below, no, and rapidly on the right flank, no. The type of serration suggests that uh, uh, the white shark was the responsible of the attack and possibly it was a big white shark, about uh, four or five meters long. This oceanographic research platform is just eight miles south of Venice. In July 1978, it was visited by a white shark. In this position, just looking outside, we spot two fins moving in synchronous motion about 400-500 meters away. 
And we started discussing if it was a shark or not. The shark soon disappeared, so they went inside, forgot all about it and got on with their lunch. So this is what we came in the morning. We Suddenly, there was a tremendous shock to the whole structure, to the whole frame, and uh, the dish flew out of my hand on the floor. They'd just been rammed by two tons of white shark. Cavalieri rushed outside and managed to take two shots of the shark. A few moments later, we spot uh, the remnants of the dolphin close to the tower. You can just make out bits of the dolphin's rib cage, and on the far right, the teeth in its jawbone. And it was smelling a lot, but clearly it had been left there by the shark. The shark had vomited up the dolphin. Horrific evidence that dolphins are indeed a major part of the white shark's staple diet in the Mediterranean. Back in Favignana, Ferguson still has one piece of the puzzle to solve. If and where white sharks breed in the Mediterranean. He finds a vital clue pinned to the wall of the fishermen's courtyard. Some original pictures here of when the fins were cut off and put on the wall. You can see there's quite a bit of shrinkage. Yeah, you can see the, the, the side actually met yeah. right up against this pipe. It's, it's actually pulled, the pulled away clear. from the wall. Yeah. But you can see clearly the writing, and it's still on it. Squala Bianco, white shark, female. Yeah. 2,000 kilograms approximately. This says 5.35 meters yeah. total length. Date of capture, 8th of May, 87. The, the interesting thing here is uh, we've got what appears to be reproductive scars from probably a male that, uh, that had grasped this female by the pectoral fins. Yeah. Um, look at how right. actually it was, they were fairly gentle bites. Yes, I know, um, yeah. As and they're they, on the other fin as well. Yeah, That's as if the, as the male was deliberately holding back in its bites. Having this, said that, look at that. Yeah. And it's on the original picture it's as very, well. It's very clear. You can so that hasn't happened can, since it was put on the wall. That's yeah. not weathering. That's, yeah. that's an actual sort of excised portion from the, from the back of the fin there. By gripping the female by her pectoral fins, the male can control and steer her movements during mating. Since we already know that males consort with females around Favignana, it is possible that this is where this female received her love bites. Thanks to specimens provided by this deep water fishing fleet at Bazzara del Vallo on the south coast of Sicily, we can pinpoint more accurately where white sharks are breeding in the Mediterranean. These are jaws of juvenile white sharks. They were caught around Sicily, in the Sicily Channel and possibly along the northern African coast. The smallest specimen uh, possibly is a newborn specimen, I think uh, a year old about. It's possible that uh, uh, pregnant females no, uh, discharge youngs no, in the Mediterranean. No? I suspect that uh, this area is a nursery for these species. This research has gone further than simply convincing skeptics that white sharks are breeding in the Mediterranean. It is now accepted that the area Ferguson and Fulgosi have identified between Sicily, Malta and the North African coast is the most precisely reported white shark breeding ground anywhere in the world. The white shark is anything but a casual visitor to the Mediterranean. With Ian and Mark is Tony Grek the survivor of that fatal shark attack on Jack Smedley in Malta 39 years ago. He has agreed to take us out to the exact point in St. Thomas Bay where the attack happened. We were enjoying our, our swim and then all of a sudden 
I heard Mr. Smedley shout, look out. Look out! Turning my head towards the direction where Mr. Smedley was supposed to be, I couldn't see anything. Instantly, something brushed against my body under the water and I got hold of it, see? And uh, the area where I got hold to was uh, cold and hard and slippery. I also saw a fin passing in front of me. I can't recall whether it was a, a dorsal fin or a side fin. Mm -hmm. Also, I noticed that on my right hand side, a, a small distance away, the, the, the tail of the fish butting out of the water, see? Yes. And then all of a sudden, I saw something under the water, which so I couldn't uh, make up actually what it was, but all of a sudden, Mrs. Madley was dragged, dragged down again and disappeared completely from, from my view. With what we now know about white shark behavior in the Mediterranean, it is possible to suggest why Jack Smedley met his death. What we know is that the ecology of St. Thomas and other bays up and down the coast here was very different then to how it is today. One of the major differences was that tuna were actively fished in some of these bays very close inshore. And we also know from the old records that white sharks were caught in those nets with variable frequency. I suspect what happened on that day was a white shark, perhaps following tuna, cruised into the bay. Maybe it lost the tuna it was following, but decided just to hang around anyway. The two swimming, the only two people who were swimming far out in the bay was Jack Smedley and Tony Grek. At the surface, they were an easily available opportunity to the white shark. They were easily spotted. The white shark essentially cruised behind them. It came up, it grabbed Jack Smedley, and it had no intention of ever letting him go. Although attack rates in the Mediterranean are lower than in other parts of the world, the percentage of victims that are totally ingested is higher. In the Mediterranean, the white shark is adapted for a very varied diet. And that sometimes includes us. This is the business end of a white shark. In recent years, two gigantic white sharks have been caught by a single fisherman, Alfredo Cutaya, from the village of Vidi Zuria, near the islet of Filfla in Malta. This first one here, when did you catch this one? Uh, 22 years ago. 23 years ago. Yeah. And what size was this shark? Um, 18 feet. 18 long. feet long. Whereabouts in the Maltese waters did you catch it? Uh, this one near the filfila with the net. Okay. Uh, at the surface or at the bottom? Uh, the bottom, you see. On the bottom of On the, the bottom. sea. So, Alfredo, this second shark is obviously as large, if not larger. When did you catch this one? This one we caught in 1987. 1987. No, and how long, how long was this shark? 23 feet long. 23 feet, goodness me. Um, that shark, uh, was that taken in a net as well, or was that...? No, that's with the line, with the hook. OK, with a bait. With the bait is an eel. How did you get this shark up to the surface and back to the port? Uh, follow the boat and f for, the, for hours follow the boat. It can go slowly because very big, is it? <laughs> <laughs> because then the boat, the boat is 15 feet. Really? And this yeah. one is 23 feet long. Isn't yeah, it? much bigger than your boat. Yes, much bigger. Alfredo hauled the shark up onto the ramp at Vidi Zuria and then did a very silly thing because at this point the shark's heart was still beating faintly. The shark was too heavy for the winch to handle and so they pushed it back into the water, tied it behind a larger boat and set off around the coast to the big fishing port of Marshashlok, where they pulled it out of the water with a crane. And local shark enthusiast John Abela got his first look at it. Uh, 
the shark was uh, towed with this crane and uh, loaded onto a truck. From here, they left to the fisheries, and this is the first time I really got to measure the shark because it was standing flat on the floor and I measured it accurately at 23 feet 5 inches and I measured it twice over to make sure I'm correct. When uh, the shark was gutted um, we found a 6 foot blue shark whole intact, an 8 foot dolphin which was split into three pieces and a 2 foot turtle. John Abela became the proud owner of these jaws. And Alfredo's white shark, all seven meters of it, is still awaiting confirmation by the Guinness Book of Records as the biggest white shark ever landed anywhere in the world. Before we go away with the impression that the Mediterranean is positively bristling with white sharks, there's a cautionary tale from the northern Mediterranean, 700 miles away from Malta, where white sharks were once commonplace. These sports fishermen are off into the Adriatic Sea, hunting for one of the white shark's diminutive relatives, the blue shark. In the past, over-enthusiastic game fishermen have devastated the shark population in these waters. But now, big game Italia are helping science by catching, tagging, and releasing the sharks. Irene Bianchi is running the only systematic tag and release study of sharks in the Mediterranean. It may already be too little, too late, because even the blue shark is hanging on in the Adriatic for dear life. These tags, if ever returned, will give her valuable information on the growth and migration of blue sharks throughout the Mediterranean. The blue shark is all that we saw of a once thriving shark ecology here. White sharks also used to be plentiful. Now they are at best only occasional visitors. Forty years ago, there was plenty for them to eat. We had uh, tuna traps uh, that were, you know, all along the, co the coastal area in Dalmatia, in Istria, and around Trieste. Uh, we had uh, huge amounts of boats going out fishing. We had, for example, dolphins belonging to two species, common dolphins and bottlenose dolphins. There were so many and so plentiful that a bounty on them was declared by both Croatian and Italian authorities. But over the last 40 years, industrial and agricultural pollution from the heart of Italy has flowed down through the Po River estuary and into the Adriatic. It became a dumping ground for toxic sludge. Fish died, and the beaches are still regularly disfigured by unpleasant tides of mucilaginous algae. It's all taken its toll. There is no uh, more any viable tuna population uh, that can be fished. All the tuna traps have uh, disappeared. Um, there is no uh, industrial fishery for tuna. Uh, dolphins, um, one of the two species has completely disappeared, the common dolphin, whereas the bottlenose dolphin survives in very 
uh, small pockets uh, along the Croatian side. And um, uh, the Adriatic Sea is known throughout the world as one of the most degraded. If the PCBs don't get the white sharks, maybe the uncontrolled overfishing of the Mediterranean will. The thing that will happen eventually is that these resources will become uh, commercially extinct and that of course will regulate the fishery. Now what this will mean to the great white shark is a question mark and I don't think it's good news. Back off the coast of Malta, our shark sighting trip is just about to end. We're down to the last battle of Chum. Our white shark fish restaurant is about to close, and our guests failed to show. Time to start engines and head the boat back into Valletta. The Mediterranean has just been listed a center of abundance and reproduction for white sharks, alongside South Africa, Australia, and California. Yet here, the white shark may already be on a knife edge. Ian Ferguson's research has given us some fascinating new insights into white shark behavior, which makes it all the more tragic that they may be on the point of departure from the sea in which they were first recorded by mankind. What worries me is that if we look at the northern Adriatic, or the Côte d'Azur, or the Ligurian coast of Italy, where white sharks were once part of the scenery in tuna fisheries through the last century up till about 1950, 1960, they're now so occasional and so rare that uh, it really is a unique capture to see them. But having said that, we've spoken to the fishermen who've caught them on this island. We've spoken to people who've seen them, both from boats and while diving. So they're definitely here, and I will be back. And I hope to be the first person to have the pleasure of putting a tag on a Mediterranean white shark. <laughs>